I'm Simon Whistler, you're watching the Today I Found Out YouTube channel, and in the video today you're going to learn about one of the positive things that came out of the Great Depression. Let's find out what that was. Scrabble and the Great Depression there aren't a great number of positive things that can be attributed to the Great Depression. However, Scrabble is a game that probably wouldn't have existed without it. It all began with an unemployed architect by the name of Alfred Mosher Butts of Poughkeepsie, New York. Thanks to his excessive free time while unemployed, he decided to invent a word game that was inspired by anagrams and crossword puzzles. Butts' decision to go with a word game was partially from previous study he had done into popular games. In his 1930s, one paper, aptly titled Study of Games, he noted that nearly all popular games of the day were either strategy, move-based games, number games, or letter games, with the former two being the most popular. He felt that the third category had quite a bit of untapped potential. A few years later, he put the finishing touches on the prototype of his own letter-based game. Butts originally called his game Lexico and it didn't require a board to play, simply comprising of small cardboard squares with letters on them. Otherwise, the game was very similar to the modern version. Letters even had their signature points value. He determined these values by performing a frequency analysis on the alphabet from sources such as the New York Times. In order to combat the lazy use of plurals, he included only four S tiles. By 1938, Butts changed the name of his game to Chris Crosswords and had added a 15 by 15 board. Although he personally developed multiple sets in an attempt to sell them to large game manufacturers, he was unsuccessful in this venture. An entire decade passed before Butts' game began seeing any kind of recognition. Things changed when a Connecticut man by the name of James Bruneau happened to have a copy of Chris Crosswords and believed that it could be commercially successful. He subsequently bought the manufacturing rights from Butts on the condition that the latter would get royalties on every copy sold. Once he owned the rights, Bruno decided to tweak things somewhat, such as shifting the starting points to the middle instead of the top left corner and renaming the game Scrabble, which means an act of searching or scrambling for something, from the Dutch Scrabblen. He also redesigned the board slightly, including coming up with the now familiar color scheme. After perfecting the game, Bruno and his wife set up shop in an abandoned schoolhouse in Doddington, Connecticut. Despite Bruno's enthusiasm, only a couple of thousand units were sold during Scrabble's first year of production. After expenses, this actually resulted in a net loss of $450 that year, about $4,200 today. Business remained slow until a couple of years later when Macy's president, Jack Strauss, played the game while on vacation in 1952. Upon his return, he was shocked that his store didn't sell the game and proceeded to place a large order. Apparently, his hunch about the game was correct because within 12 months, it was the must-have game for American households. Thanks to a huge surge in orders, Bruno could no longer keep up with the demand, so licensed the rights to game maker Sel Chow and Writer. Two years later, sales of the game had risen to over 4 million sets sold. Not bad for a game that Sel Chow and Writer had previously rejected back when Butts was the owner, as did Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers. While you'll often read that Butts ultimately did not receive anything for the game he invented, this isn't true at all. By the time Bruno sold the trademark rights to Sel Chow and Writer, rather than just licensing the game to them, in 1971, Butts had received about $275,000 in royalties, approximately $2 million today. Bruno fared better, walking away from the whole thing with about $1.5 million, about $11.5 million today. The game was still going strong 30 years after its big boom when Sel Chow and Writer was sold to Colico. Unfortunately, the latter company went bankrupt shortly afterwards, but Scrabble was quickly snatched up by Hasbro, and later the international rights were acquired by Mattel for $90 million. Today, Scrabble seems to be as popular as ever. Besides its online and otherwise digital popularity, it is estimated that roughly one-third of U.S. households contain a physical copy of the game, as well as a little over half of all households in Great Britain. To date, over 150 million sets have been sold worldwide, making it one of the most popular board games of all time. Bonus Facts Leo Fender of Fender Guitar fame was also out of work thanks to the Great Depression when he decided to start his own company, Fender Radio and Record Shop. 
He was previously an accountant. Despite going on to be famous for his guitars, Fender never learned to play the guitar, hiring musicians to test out his designs instead. Bonus fact 2. Alfred Butts invented another game in 1985 which was rather aptly titled Alfred's Other Game. It still included words and points, but had more of a solitaire-type gameplay to it. Bonus fact 3. Besides inventing Scrabble and his other game, Butts was also an amateur artist. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is in possession of six of Butts' drawings. Bonus fact 4. There was a Scrabble game show that ran from 1984 to 1990. It contained a crossword round and a Scrabble sprint round to determine the winner of that week's show. The very existence of such a show may seem strange, but there used to be a Cluedo game show in Australia and the UK during the 90s. It was amazing. So I really hope you liked that video, and if you did like it, click like below and leave us a comment to let us know what you think. And also check out a couple of our other videos, which are linked to on the screen now, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos every day. Thanks for watching.